Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, so let me see. Oh, maybe before I begin, I should apologize because I made an error in my lecture yesterday, uh, which is, I mean, if it, uh, maybe maybe this came up in the problem session with Peter earlier, but I assigned an exercise saying, here is an example of a non-integral apartment class when n equals two, show that you can't negate it using an element in SL2Z. And I accidentally selected a non-integral apartment class that you actually could still negate sort of by accident. Um, so I, I fixed, I, I changed the notes to replace it with something that you in fact could not negate so that that exercise will work out. So anyway, sorry for the error. Um, hopefully this did not create too much confusion. Uh, okay, with that note, let's begin uh, my third and uh, final solo talk of this series. Um, I will start with a review from the uh, summary of the key points from the previous lectures and a reminder of what our goal is of this three lecture series. So we're studying the top degree cohomology of SLNR when R is uh, the ring of integers in a number field. And as Peter explained, we have borel sayer duality. So we have this result that we can relate the high degree cohomology of SLNR with coefficients in the just trivial module Q with the low degree homology uh, in this coefficient module that's twisted now by the Steinberg representation. So we saw the Steinberg module is this representation of SLNZ that's defined in terms of the top degree homology of the Tietz building. So remember, this is a simplicial complex where the vertices correspond to subspaces of the uh, of in the vector space over the field Fn, and the simplices correspond to flags. So it's a result of Solomon and Tietz that this Tietz building is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres of dimension n minus two. And moreover, that this, so we, we have this one non-vanishing reduced homology group, the Steinberg module, they showed moreover that this Steinberg module, this, this homology group is generated by apartment classes. So these are these spheres in the Tietz building that are, um, that correspond to frames to direct some decompositions of Fn into lines. For each such decomposition, we, we discussed how there is a corresponding sphere in the Tietz building. And so these, these apartment classes, they're not a basis for the homology, but they do generate it. Great. Okay. And um, some motivation for our series are these church bar pumpman conjectures that state if we specialize to the case where r is the integers, the high degree, in fact, the co-dimension i cohomology of the special linear group over the rational numbers vanishes once n is large in a linear range, once n is large. Okay, so that's, that's conjectured. This has been proven for i equals 0, 1, and 2 at this point, and is open in general. Okay. And we've been, in my, in my three lecture series, we're focusing on understanding why it's true in the case that i equals 0. So why do we get vanishing of these cohomology groups in the top degree? And in fact, we're talking about that not just for the integers, but for a general Euclidean number ring. Okay. So this is a result of Lee and Sharba. When R is Euclidean, we have vanishing of this top degree cohomology. And what we proved in the first lecture is that if we assume this result of Ash and Rudolph, that will imply this vanishing result. So Ash and Rudolph proved that if R is a Euclidean domain, 
then the Steinberg module is in fact generated not just by apartment classes, but integral apartment classes. So apartment classes that come not just from a frame for Fn, but in fact from a frame for Rn. They come from these, these integral apartments that have some sort of uh, determinant one condition. Okay. And in my second lecture, we showed, we talked about how we could prove this ash rudolph theorem. And we proved it. This, this, is a, this is not historically accurate. We are not using original proofs. We're proving older results using newer results. But in the second lecture, we talked about how we could prove this result of Ash and Rudolph using a result of Mason, which states that if R is Euclidean, then the barycentric subdivision of the complex of partial bases is Cohen-Macaulay of dimension n minus one. So remember this complex of partial bases, this is a simplicial complex where the vertices correspond to primitive vectors in, in Rn. So now we're working over the ring and not over the field. So these are primitive vectors in Rn. And the simplices correspond to partial bases. Okay, so that a partial basis is a subset of a basis equivalently in our case, that means a basis for a direct sum and of Rn. All right. And right, so the statement that this partial basis complex is Cohen-Macaulay, remember that the slogan was Cohen-Macaulay means that it is as highly connected, it has homotopy groups vanishing in the same range, as a standard n minus one sphere, and the links are also as highly connected as the links in a standard n minus one sphere. So that's Cohen-Macaulay. Using, using this uh, lemma due to Quillen about maps of post-set sequences, we managed to prove the ash rudolph theorem um, using Mason's theorem about this high connectivity result for the complex of partial bases and its links. So our goal for today is to talk about how we could prove this result. We're working backwards towards the proof. All right, all right, here is our reminder that the statement that X is Cohen-Macaulay, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't turn the page. Okay, we're on page 11 now. This was a reminder, the statement that X is Cohen-Macaulay at dimension D is the statement that it's a D-dimensional simplicial complex and that both X and its links are as highly connected as those in a standard D-sphere. That's what Cohen-Macaulay means. So here's, here's the, uh, the map of my, of my three lectures. In the first lecture, um, or the, the goal, the goal of the whole series is to prove this lee Sharpa result, which is written here. This is the statement that the top dimensional cohomology of SLN R vanishes when R is Euclidean. So in the first lecture, we proved this implication. We showed that that is true assuming generation of the Steinberg module by integral apartment classes. In lecture number two, we proved this implication here. We showed Ash Rudolph holds, um, assuming this result of Mason that says the complex of partial bases is Cohen-Macaulay. And today we're gonna prove this result of Mason. We're gonna prove that this complex of partial bases is Cohen-Macaulay and that concludes the proof. And the goal to do this, we're gonna use, we're gonna prove uh, this result today using an argument due to Church and Putman. And one reason I wanted to use this particular argument is that um, the, the proof showcases, I guess in, in sort of a warm-up example, some of the methods that were used by both Church Putman and by uh, Brooke Miller, Pat Sroka, and, and myself to prove the co-dimension one and co-dimension two vanishing results um, the the co-dimension one and co-dimension two cases of the church far putman conjecture. So bo both of those results, at least in a, in a very high order sense, um, use the same outline that I'm going to talk about today. Okay. Are there, I guess, any questions about the background or about this overview the, the goals for today before I start. All right, no questions. Great. Okay, so let's continue. So um, 
for today's lecture, I'm going to specialize to the case where R is the integers. And um, let's write, just for brevity, we'll write PBN for um, the partial basis complex of the integers. Okay. And it's going to be uh, left as an exercise to, to generalize uh, the argument to a general Euclidean ring. Uh, this, this exercise, in fact, won't be too hard. I think the only point where we actually use properties of the integers is when we explicitly use the Euclidean algorithm. So I think this is not, uh, not a difficult exercise. But let's, for simplicity, just work over the integers. Here is a definition or some notation. First of all, I would like throughout the talk, I'm going to write E1 through EK as the standard basis for Z to the K. And following uh, Church and Putman, let's use the notation PBMN. This is notation to denote the link in the partial basis complex n plus m of the first, the, the simplex span by the first m standard basis elements. So really explicitly remembering what, what I mean, remembering the definition of a link, this means, this means it's going to be the, the complex of, of um, simplices of the form, uh, oh, maybe I should use my square notation, simplices of the form v1 up to vq such that v1 up to vq and then e1 up to em is a partial basis. Okay, so in other words, this complex, this is the complex of partial bases of direct complements of the copy of ZM spanned by these first M basis elements in here. All right, so that, that is some shorthand that will be convenient for us. And I'm gonna leave it as a uh, not too difficult exercise to check. This is basically unpacking definitions. First of all, that in the case N is zero, then this is the empty set. So when, when N is zero, then this is just the link of a top dimensional simplex in this complex. So it's, it's empty, that link is empty. There are no complements to the entirety of this space. Okay. And the other exercise is to verify that the dimension, so notice we've, we've, now, we've now implemented this shift built into this notation. We have this M and this N, but now I'm working inside ZM plus N. Okay, and it's an exercise to check that um, the dimension of these complexes is N minus one. Uh, using the convention that the dimension of the empty set is negative one, which is actually a pretty natural uh, convention when you are, are working inductively with the idea of cohen macaulay -ness. Okay. And so the goal of today is, is the Mason result. In fact, we're going to prove the following uh, what is ostensibly a generalization of the result, but actually turns out to be equivalent, which is that for every M and N, we're going to check that this complex defined as this link, so this complex right here, is Cohen-Macaulay of dimension N minus one. Okay. And very concretely, rem uh, let's, let's, rem let's remember what the conditions are to prove that. 
So IE, we're going to prove, well, first of all, that it's the dimension of this complex uh, is n minus one. That was the exercise I just assigned. That's not too hard to check. Secondly, that this complex is n minus two connected. It's homotopy groups. It's first two n minus two homotopy groups vanish. And thirdly, that the links of all of the simplices in this complex are suitably highly connected. In this case, that means n minus the dimension of sigma minus three connected for all simplices sigma. Okay, and these are the three conditions that we need to check. This is the definition of Cohen Macaulay. So notably, when, when m equals zero, then this complex, it's another exercise, is in fact just our complex of partial bases. Um, so the the main theorem, the main theorem implies the result of Mason that we're aiming for. Okay, so our goal today is to talk about how we can use some simplicial methods in algebraic topology to prove this result, this Cohen Macaulay result for these links. And when we're done that, that will complete our program, our program for proving, for proving this vanishing of the top dimensional cohomology of SLNZ. Great. Okay, so let's, let's get started. All right, so we will proceed by induction on N. Um, and the, the base case is just the statement this was this was also the exercise that um, if we let n equal zero, then these complexes are empty, which oh, I may not have stated this when I defined Cohen Macaulay, but by convention, we say that the empty set is Cohen Macaulay of dimension minus one. So that checks out. Okay, so so far so good. And then we have our inductive hypothesis. The inductive hypothesis says that we're gonna fix, fix our value n. In fact, I guess we can say greater than zero now. Fix n greater than zero. And assume that um, if we take any smaller complex then we have this cohen macaulay result for the links um, corresponding to any smaller values of n so that's that is the inductive hypothesis and so now we want to consider consider these complexes, consider these complexes, and we need to prove these three conditions, assuming our inductive hypothesis. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it as an exercise still to check this condition on the dimension. That's not too bad. Um, and the good news is that this condition on the links will actually be very easy to check because we'll be able to identify our links with these smaller complexes that we know are Cohen Macaulay or we're assuming are Cohen Macaulay by induction. Okay, so that so it turns out this condition on the links, we'll see in a second, actually just follows from the inductive hypothesis. And the content of the proof will be to check this high connectivity result. Okay, so I'm going to turn the page. I'm going to go on to page 12 in the Jamboard and um, let's just verify this claim about the links. Um, okay, 
so uh, here is um, a lemma for us or in fact, I'll make this an exercise. An exercise to check that if given any um, simplex in PB and M in our, in our complex, let's say sigma is the span of the primitive vectors V1 through VQ, then I claim that the link of PBMN of in, in PBMM of sigma is isomorphic to oops, one of these smaller named links okay and this uh, also this exercise, I mean, I think this exercise is about as difficult as unpacking the notation to understand the statement of the result. Um, the point is that, you know, here we have, these are um, uh, simplices U1 up to UL such that E1 to EM, and then V1 up to VQ, and then U1 up to UL um, is a partial basis. And then on this side, this by definition are these simplices U1 prime up to UL prime, such that E1 up to EM, and then EM plus one, up to EM plus Q, and then U1 prime up to UL prime is a partial basis. And so really this is just a matter of uh, observing that we can sort of identify these sets using some sort of change of basis transformation and that a, you know, a linear change of basis transformation taking that takes these, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that takes, that takes these Vs this set E m plus one to E m plus Q, that change of basis transformation is going to induce a simplicial automorphism on these complexes. Okay, so so please please do think through that exercise and make sure that makes sense. But um, the shorthand is, uh, in short, this is I think not too difficult a result, and uh, as as advertised, it implies that. Um, that the link of one of these simplices is indeed, and you can you can check that this this dimension uh, matches the inductive hypothesis. It is indeed n minus the dimension of sigma minus three connected by the inductive hypothesis. Okay, great. So we have reduced the problem of uh, approving the main theorem to the problem of checking that these links are highly connected or n minus two connected. Okay, so uh, to prove to prove the main theorem it suffices to show, that this complex PBMN is N minus two connected and assuming the inductive hypothesis. So we can assume that yeah, we'll, we'll continue to assume the inductive hypothesis in this proof. Okay. And we're going to, we're going to prove this in a totally hands-on way. So we are going to literally take a map from a sphere into this complex. And we are going to argue that that map is null homotopic to check that the corresponding homotopy group vanishes. Okay.
So let's fix uh, fix p to be between zero and n minus two. And we're going to let phi be a map from a p sphere into this complex. And our goal, we're done, we're done this whole proof, if we can show that this map phi is null homotopic. Which shows it, which shows so the corresponding homotopy group vanishes. Okay. And here's a fact that uses the simplicial approximation theorem from algebraic topology, along with some, some classical PL topology theory, which is that. Um, up to homotopy, we can assume, first of all, that this map is simplicial with respect to some choice of simplicial structure on the sphere. Oh my gosh, uh, sorry, my computer just froze. That's weird. We can still hear you or your camera still works. My camera still works. My um, iPad just Oh, your broke. iPad froze, not your computer. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let me. No, froze again. Okay. Sorry. Minor technical problems. Okay. So, anyway, so sorry. Let me say aloud what I'm about to write, and hopefully this will eventually load again. I don't know what the problem is, but um, uh, so what I was about to say out loud is that um, the we can assume not only that this map is simplicial with respect to some simplicial structure on the p-sphere, but moreover, we can assume that it's a nice simplicial structure, possibly after modifying the map up to homotopy, we can assume that it's a nice simplicial structure um, with the property that the links of simplices in the sphere are always spheres themselves or are, are, are um, Uh, simplicial spheres. Okay, great. And I think this is working again. So up to homotopy, uh, we can assume, uh, first of all, oh, there's something I wanted to do. Okay. First of all, that this map is simplicial. And secondly, that um, for any simplex tau in the sphere, the link of tau, whoops, the link of tau is um, a sphere itself of the appropriate dimension. Okay, which I think you will find is the case if you if you just start to write down um, you know, your favorite simplicial structure on a sphere, then, then you will almost certainly find that this is the case uh, for links. Okay. Great. So our strategy for this proof is um, affectionately called a badness argument. Okay. And so let me let me set a little bit more notation. So first of all, let's define um, a function f on the vertices of uh, of our link PBMN. So uh, takes values in the positive integers. Um, this is the function that takes v. So v, I'm going to view, I'm going to view as a vector um, in z m plus n. So it makes sense to talk about the entries of v. And I'm going to, I'm going to map this to the absolute value of the last entry of v. Okay. So more generally, here this here we're using our Euclidean function. The fact that the z is a Euclidean domain and this absolute value gives me a Euclidean function. 
um, I'm applying that to the last entry of the vector V. Okay, and with that definition, we can define our badness function on the sphere. Okay, this is the function, the function of the map B. And it's gonna take a vertex in my sphere and give me a positive or non-negative integer rather. And so it takes, it takes an integer um, X to the Euclidean function applied to the last entry of the image of X in PBMN. Okay. This is just the composition of phi and f, right? This is just the composition of, of phi and f, exactly, exactly. That's right. Um, and so uh, the, right, so this is called, we're, we're, we call this our badness function. And um, the point is, the following exercise, leave this as an exercise, it's not also not too, well, also about as hard as kind of unpacking the definitions of everything involved. The, the exercise is to show that if B had the property that this badness function had value zero at every vertex X, um, then B would be demonstrably null homotopic. Then, then in this case, specifically the image of phi in, in, our, in our link um, is contained moreover in the link and um, so we can homotope We can homotope B to the constant map the constant map at the vertex E M plus N, that last standard basis element. Right? So here, here's kind of the picture that if this is if this is my last. This is my last, um, uh, my m plus nth basis element viewed as a vertex in my complex. If the image of phi is contained in its link, then we can just homotope phi to this point, and then we would see that phi is null homotopic and we'd be done. And so we view. This is our desired outcome. We want to we want to homotope the map phi so that we can reduce these r values to zero at every single one of the vertices, and we think of r as our badness function since it's somehow a measure of how far away we are from that goal. So we want to we want to get all these badness values down to zero, and if we can do that, we win. We can prove that our map is null homotopic. Are there any questions up to this point? Doesn't seem to be the case. Great. Okay. So I'm going to call R max to be the maximum value of this badness function over all vertices in my sphere. Oh, and bearing in mind, spheres are compact, so any simplicial structure on the sphere is finite. In particular, it has finitely many vertices. So that makes this problem kind of tractable. It makes it amenable to some sort of inductive argument. And what we're going to do is um, we are going to argue that we can homotope this, uh, this function phi we can homotope our map from a sphere phi to reduce this R max value. And if we can do that, again, we're done by induction. 
then we can homotope it down to zero. And then we're in this link, so we can homotope our sphere to this point and we're done. Okay. So I'm going to let n be this, um, this r max value. And let's call a simplex in SP, we'll call it bad if every one of its vertices has um, R value equal to this maximally bad value N, right? We know, we know this is finite, or we know, we know this number is finite because it, the sphere has finitely many uh, vertices. And um, we're going to let tau be a bad, a bad simplex of maximal dimension. among all the bad simplices in SP, okay? And our goal is to show that we can, well, in fact, our goal is to show that we can reduce the dimension of this bad simplex in a way that I'll uh, illustrate later on. I'll say precisely what I mean by that later on. But if we can resolve bad simplices without introducing any more maximal dimensional bad simplices, then we can eventually get that maximal R value uh, reduced by at least one, and then, uh, and then we win by induction. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to page 13 in the notes and just say the idea. The idea is to homotope, is to homotope the map B to push, I'm having some, Jamboard issues to push the image, to push it off, uh, to sorry, push the simplex tau off the image of tau and into its link. Okay. But in order, in order to make this strategy work, we need to under we have to make sure that we're pushing it off onto its link onto vertices that have more favorable badness values. We want to make sure that we push it onto vertices with smaller R values um, or smaller F values. And so in order to make sense of that, we need to understand the subcomplex of the link of vertices that have small F value. And that is uh, why we need a little tangent right now into studying the subcomplex of the link. And this is in fact the crucial part where we're gonna use the Euclidean property of the integers. So the definition is for a simplex sigma in, um, oh, actually, sorry, let me let me give the definition first. Um, for a subcomplex, for a subcomplex X in PBMN, we're going to define x strictly less than n. This is going to be the subcomplex of x um, that is spanned the full subcomplex on vertices on vertices v with small f value. So that means their last coordinate is less than n in absolute value. Okay, and here is the key lemma that makes this entire operation work. The key lemma is the following, which is that if I have any simplex in PB and M, and I have, uh, I need to choose a vertex W in my, in my simplex uh, with uh, positive last coordinate, okay, under those assumptions, then there exists a retraction um, there exists the retraction, we'll call it pi from the link
of sigma to this subcomplex of the link with absolute values less than n. And on vertices, so de to define pi on vertices, what we're going to do is I'm going to replace, I'm going to map V to uh, the primitive vector I get by taking this linear combination, V minus Q times W, W is my distinguished vertex in sigma. And this value Q, this is the quotient in the sense of the Euclidean algorithm. that I get by taking the last coordinate of V divided by the last coordinate of W. And so the Euclidean algorithm exactly guarantees for me that when I perform, when I take this difference, the last coordinate of the resulting vector is going to be strictly less than N. All right. And I guess, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave checking all of this lemma as an exercise. Um, so what that means, you need to check that, uh, well, first of all, that this is well-defined at all, that this, in fact, is a primitive vector, and it does, in fact, live in this link. And moreover, you need to check that if I have a collection of vertices in the link that span a simplex, then when I apply this map, when I subtract off some multiple of W from each of them, then the result still spans a simplex in this link. And, um, Right, that, that, that exercise, I mean, again, I think that's about as hard as unpacking the definitions of everything that's going on here. It's, it reduces it to an easy linear algebra problem, but there's something to check there. And then finally, you need to check that this is a retraction. So you need to check that we can always um, choose Q to arrange that this will, will fix vertices that um, are already in this less than link. Okay, that's also, that's also good. And the reason this lemma is so useful to us, so it's the details are left as, a, as an exercise, which again, I promise is actually not difficult linear algebra once you unpack the definitions of everything. Um, the reason this lemma is so useful to us is the following, that then by the inductive hypothesis, by the inductive hypothesis, we know that the link of our uh, simplex sigma is highly connected. Okay. Um, and that implies by the lemma, because retractions induce surjective maps on homotopy groups just by functoriality, um, that implies that in fact, this, this link, I'm gonna not write out the whole thing, but this link less than complex is also N minus Tim Sigma minus three connected. Okay, and this is the key point. This is the key point we need to carry out this badness argument. This is what we need in order to push our bad simplex tau, um, its image into its link. We need to push it into the less than n part of the link so that we somehow reduce the badness of our map under this homotopy, under of our map P. Okay. So, right, so that was our, that was our aside. Let me block that off. 
and recall where we were, we had our map B from our sphere to PBMN, and we had tau, which was a max maximal dimensional bad simplex. That means it's a simplex with the property that every single one of its vertices mapped to a maximal bad R value. Um, and great, our goal is again, to somehow push the image of tau into its link. And in fact, into this less than N part of the link in a way that will reduce um, up to homotopy, it will somehow get, get rid of this bad simplex for us. It will, um, and ultimately as we iterate this process, it will in fact completely get rid of, it will reduce um, th these, these R values on each of the vertices of this bad simplex. Okay, and then, then we're done by induction. And um, to do this, recall we had this assumption on our, um, on the simplicial structure on SP that said that the link in of tau in the sphere uh, is itself a sphere of whatever of complementary dimension to tau in the sphere. Okay. And uh, let, uh, let me assign as an exercise, there's also something to check here, but I claim that our map phi is going to map the link. It's going to map the link of, of the simplex tau into the link of the image of tau. Okay, there's already content to this statement. So you need to make sure because, so here's an observation, every vertex in the link of tau has to have R value strictly less than that of tau. Otherwise it would violate this maximal dimensionality assumption. Otherwise we could just like join tau with this new vertex and get a higher dimensional simplex that is also bad. So every, every vertex in the link of tau has to map to a smaller badness value. And so one thing that tells us is that they can't actually map onto the image of tau. They have to map into the, they have to map into the link of the image of tau. And secondly, even more so, that tells us they have to map into this less than n part of the link of tau. Okay. And so that's great because this, this is a, this link is a sphere. And we just said, we just went to all this trouble to prove that this link less than N subcomplex of the link is highly connected. It's homotopy groups vanish in a range. And in fact, you can check that the numbers work out so that this, the image of the sphere or the, the map from the sphere has to be null homotopic into this link. And, and that's the, that is the crucial step in this argument. So I'll leave it again as an exercise to check the numbers, to check that P minus the dimension of tau minus one has to be less than or equal to N minus the dimension of the image of tau minus three. So when we restrict our map B to the link of tau, the resulting map is null homotopic via, via this result, okay? And um, again, it's a, it's a fact that I guess takes, I'm gonna brush under the rug all the PL topology that goes into the the background of this, but it's a fact that this means that we can fill the image of that sphere with a simplicial ball. So there exists um, some ball B and a simplicial ball B and a simplicial map from B to this, this link of 
this link less than uh, filling filling the sphere that was the image of the link of tau. Okay. And so I claim, and we'll, and just we'll go over this in the last five minutes. I claim that this means we can homotope, we can homotope phi to eliminate the max amal dimensional bad simplex, bad simplex tau. And um, to show you exactly what I mean by that, uh, I should say, I I'm gonna totally just wave my hands for the rest of this lecture. There are more details written out um, more, more formally, more, more carefully in the lecture notes, if you're interested. But for our purposes, let us just um, draw some pictures of what this means. So, and in fact, let me... Uh, see if I can find here. I brought some pictures for us to see. Whoops, let me do that. Okay, so here are some pictures of um, what I mean by we're going to homotope to remove this bad simplex tau. So, all right, in this picture, Here's my picture. I'm, we're going to do this. We're going to do this in two examples just to see what we mean in both cases. In the first example, the first example, here's my p-sphere. We have some map B from the p-sphere into PB, uh, the, the complex PB. And in the first case, we're going to consider the case where tau is just a single point. So in this case, tau is a single point. Um, it's a point in some triangulation of this sphere. And as, as promised, its link is a circle. Its link is this circle that's drawn in orange. And here is a picture of what's supposed to be the image of this entire, this is the star of tau, tau join its link. It's an image of this entire star inside PB. Everything, everything, each of the panels in this cartoon now takes place inside PB. Okay, and uh, this is supposed to be a picture of this less than link around the image of here, this purple dot is the image of tau. Here's a picture of my less than link, which is indeed highly connected. It's a sphere in this picture. Um, and uh, let's see, notably the statement that this is a subcomplex of the link of phi of tau means that like this ball is completely solid, that there is that um, these, these triangles are all opposite faces from tau in some three-dimensional simplices. Okay. And so great. So here's as promised, here's the link of tau. And it is mapped to some circle inside this less than link. And we can fill that circle with a disk shown in blue because this less than link is highly connected. And the point is then that we can homotope, we can use the fact that there's this disk, um, sorry, this, this higher dimensional simplicial disk that is the join of this blue disk and the simplex, the image of tau, we can use this higher dimensional disk to define a homotopy that pushes, uh, in this case, our point that is the image of tau down to, we're gonna push what was this entire yellow, uh, image of the star, we're going to push that onto this blue disk up by this homotopy. And we're going to do that. Notice we're doing that in a way that fixes the boundary of the star. It fixes the orange boundary. And what that means is that we can extend this homotopy over the entire sphere. We can extend it 
by just fixing phi outside of this yellow subcomplex. And when we're done, the point tau no longer lands on this bad spot with badness n, it lands inside the link less than complex. So it's going to land necessarily on a vertex with r value strictly less than n. Okay. So the upshot is if tau is a single point, then we can perform this homotopy in such a way that lowers its r value. That's great. The picture is a little more complicated in the case when tau is a higher dimensional simplex. So I'll just gesture at this briefly and I encourage you to meditate on these pictures later if you're interested in these details. But in this picture, we see now, now we're looking at the case where tau is an edge. And again, its link is now a, a zero sphere. It's just these two points. And here's a picture of the image of tau inside the complex. And here's a picture of the, the use the same less than link again. And again, uh, because the link less than is highly connected, we can put this blue disk. In this case, it's just an edge or the union of two edges. Um, it's a line segment. We can, we can um, fill this zero sphere by this edge. And then again, we can perform this homotopy. We have using this uh, simplicial disk. The simplicial ball, we can perform this homotopy on its boundary that pushes. So what we originally had, this was our original image of this yellow subcomplex. But after we perform the homotopy, we get this blue subcomplex instead. And the point is, if you look at what has happened here, the point is, in this case, we actually haven't moved any of the vertices at all. So the this subcomplex, its vertex set maps to the same four vertices here. However, what we have done is we've modified the simplicial structure on the sphere so that originally I had this edge in my sphere that connected these two maximally bad vertices. But after I perform this homotopy, that edge isn't there anymore. So the simplicial structure has changed so that now um, that this purple edge in this particular example is, is like broken up into a union of two edges. Or I don't know if this if we could skip this, if, if this um, edge didn't, wasn't subdivided, there would just be no edges here at all. So we've changed the simplicial structure so that our, what was a two-dimensional, sorry, pardon me, a one-dimensional maximally bad simplex is now a union of two zero-dimensional maximally bad simplices. So we can repeat the argument and we can repeat and repeat and repeat until we've broken up our maximally bad simplices into just a bunch of isolated um, bad points and then use this last step to, uh, to push them all into the link up to homotopy. And then we're done. We've reduced the badness of one maximally bad simplex. We've, we've gotten rid of it. And by induction, we can reduce that badness that R max all the way to zero, and then argue that our sphere has to be null homotopic. All right. So that, uh, that concludes my lecture. There are details in the notes since that was just a hand-waving mess at the end, but there are details in the notes if you're interested. And uh, thank you very much.